The following program is a production of the Alabama Cooperative Extension Service. Have you ever experienced damage from beaver or coyotes or white-tailed deer? Join us as the Alabama Cooperative Extension Service shows what you can do when good animals go bad. Now here is Extension Wildlife Scientist, Dr. Jim Armstrong. Hello and welcome to our program. Tonight we are going to talk about wildlife damage management. First off, I'd like to thank my friend Robert Schmidt of Utah State University for suggesting the title of this program, When Good Animals Go Bad. Robert and I were talking at a meeting when he mentioned the important point that None of the animals we'll discuss tonight are inherently bad. It's only when their activities have a negative impact on human activities that control may be needed. I say the word may because many times the solution does not involve the use of control measures at all, but the education of the clients. In general, wildlife biologists manage wildlife populations for the benefit of wildlife and humans. Sometimes wildlife species come into conflict with humans and steps must be taken to stop or minimize those conflicts. Depending on the situation, this may be done by manipulating the people, the wildlife, or both. Now while it's true that many other species of wildlife come into conflict with humans, three species, the beaver, the coyote, and the deer, seem to stimulate quite a bit of discussion among agricultural producers. For that reason, we'll focus on those three species in tonight's discussion. Helping me provide the expertise tonight are Frank Boyd, who is State Director of USDA APHIS Animal Damage Control, and Gary Moody, Chief of the Wildlife Section of the Alabama Department of Natural Resources Game and Fish Division. Our format tonight will consist of a brief overview of the biology of these species, a discussion of the legal aspects of control, and finally a discussion of control measures. After we discuss each species, you'll have the opportunity to call in with questions. So jot down this number, 1-800-258-2237. We encourage you to call us about these species or about wildlife damage in general. Again, our toll-free number from anywhere in the country is 1-800-258-2237. It's 1-800-258-ACES. Before we get started into the specifics, let's talk about some things that you should know about wildlife damage in general in Alabama. A survey that we did a while back uh, showed just the way we break down our calls, and you can see that we, we deal with quite a diversity of species uh, relative to wildlife damage in Alabama. Uh, this is very consistent with the activities that also go on with USDA Animal Damage Control Program. Uh, they also deal with quite a diversity of species as well, as you can see. Um, the way it's generally broken down in Alabama is that migratory species are dealt with by the federal agency because of federal jurisdiction and non-migratory species such as deer beaver tend to be handled by a state agency or by the extension service. Now with that background information, let's move on to our, our discussion. Uh, before we move on to the beaver though, let me ask y'all, uh, do you see a need for wildlife damage management increasing in the future? And if so, why? Well, I think we're definitely going to see a, uh, an increase in the need for trained uh, biologists to deal with this problem, mostly because people now are not as adept as they were several generations ago of, of understanding wildlife. Uh, we've become a more urban society, and uh, generations ago, people lived on a farm, understood wildlife, and just dealt with things. There weren't as many rules and laws and regulations to deal with as there are now. And things are just much more complex. Our, our ever-increasing human population brings humans closer together, and it's just not as easy to resolve issues as maybe it once was. So, yeah, I think we'll see more and more problems dealing with wildlife, a lot more urban problems dealing with wildlife that we're going to need trained people to take care of those problems. 
Frank, you do a lot of operational work on the ground with landowners. Uh, what's been your observation as far as wildlife damage? Well, the same thing. It's uh, growing more each year as people, uh, we get more and more people trying to live on the same amount of land and we're running into more and more problems. Yeah. I think that's a trend we've seen over the last several years, and I don't see any reason why it's going to slow down. Okay, so I think it's quite apparent that wildlife damage management is something here that's going to stay. It's certainly not going to go away anytime soon. Let's uh, begin now looking at the first of the three species. We're going to begin with a discussion of uh, beaver in Alabama. Beaver are the largest of the North American rodents. They are easily identified by their prominent flattened tail. The tail aids in support, swimming, and communication. Beaver are increasing throughout the southeastern United States. In the early 1900s, beaver were nearly extinct. However, Beaver pelts were a valuable commodity on the fur market, and beaver swamps provided valuable habitat to many additional wildlife species. So efforts were made to reestablish their populations in much of their original range. It would be safe to say that these efforts were a tremendous success. In fact, if you experience damage from beaver, you may feel these efforts were too successful. Keep in mind, though, that from a wildlife management standpoint, beaver ponds are very beneficial. The recovery of wood duck populations in the southeast is directly linked with the increased habitat available in beaver swamps. While beaver may be beneficial in many ways, from a producer standpoint, beaver ponds may be detrimental. Beaver are capable of altering their habitat to suit their needs, it's this characteristic that may bring them into conflict with landowners. Beaver will girdle and fell trees to build a lodge and dam. This act may also flood standing timber or row crops. The resulting water stress on these flooded trees or row crops may eventually cause them to die. Beaver may also build dens underneath roads, thereby weakening the structure. Depending on your specific situation, beaver control techniques may vary. Due to the sizable beaver population in the southeast, live trapping and relocating offending animals is no longer a realistic alternative. In addition, there are no repellents, toxicants, or fumigants registered for beaver control. Eliminating beaver from an area requires a combination of trapping and or shooting the beaver and destroying the dam. One of the most effective traps for beaver is the 330 conibear. We'll show you how to set this and other beaver traps in just a moment. When properly set, the conibear kills the beaver instantly. Once all the beaver have been removed from the pond, the dam can be destroyed and the water drained from the flooded timber or crops. If the damage is to just a few trees, say adjacent to a pond, you might want to consider just putting hardware cloth collars around the trees to prevent the beaver from chewing on the trees. Beaver damage is very variable and it's almost impossible to make specific recommendations during this program. However, before implementing any control strategy, it's wise to contact the conservation officer in your county. Earlier, Gary Moody, Chief of the Wildlife Section of the Alabama Game and Fish Division, pointed out some of the precautions you should address before beginning to trap. There are really a couple of issues you need to look at anytime you're dealing with beavers because you're dealing with wetland issues as well as a biological problem there. First thing we do is recommend that landowners contact the appropriate agency to find out what wetlands implications and what wetland laws need to be applied. From a biological standpoint, there are no closed seasons on beavers, and they can be taken at any time of the year by trap or gun. Anytime there's a uh, demonstrated problem that a landowner is having with beavers, they should contact the local game and fish officer if they need to have some control at night, and they can get a permit to hunt beavers at night if that would help them some. Probably the most effective is a good trapping program, and game and fish can recommend people to assist you with that. And uh, animal damage control folks have some excellent personnel that deal with beaver damage control and we can get the proper advice to the landowners. 
Let's take a few minutes with Frank Boyd to see just how you might go about setting traps to remove beaver from the problem area. Frank? Well, if once you've evaluated the problem and you decided that you do need to remove some of the beaver, the next step would be to get the proper equipment and head out to the field and, and initiate your trapping or beaver removal program. Probably the most uh, widely used tool here in Alabama is the 330 bear. This is a lethal trap. It's a, a trap designed to kill the animal uh, relatively quickly. It's one of the more easily mastered techniques, although somewhat difficult to set. Uh, they, they can be typically mastered by most landowners to where they can be fairly effective removing the beaver. Setting the trap is, is uh, a problem if you're not used to it. Each spring individually must be set. As you can see, they're setting one spring here with uh, a setting tool. This is well worth the effort to get a tool like this to help as these springs are fairly strong, you can tell. Uh, they can also be set with the rope, but a uh, setting tool like this is, is, the, is the way to go for most folks, I would think. You'll notice they're squeezing the spring in and then placing the safety hook on to hold the spring uh, closed till they finish setting the trap. Now both springs are set. They've still got to finish the procedure though, which would be to pick it up uh, and open the jaws and set the actual uh, trigger mechanism on. The, these sets can be placed on a run or a dam crawlover such as we're seeing here uh, in beaver runs or crawl outs in a wide variety of sets. As you, the jaws are, are then compressed with the, and the trigger placed in. On the 330 there'll be two small indentions on the trigger dog. Either one of these uh, positions work fine for our area, particularly for the beaver. It's not that critical how it's set. The thing to remember with beaver, uh, beaver trapping with the conibear, this is not a, a selective tool. It, it's, remember it's a lethal device and if you're concerned about non-targets, uh, you should maybe opt for another technique such as a snare or where the animal can be released if you capture a non-target. But by your selective placement of this trap in runs where you know beaver are using the beaver signs there and there's no t signs of other non-targets, you can be fairly selective in your placement. In Alabama, they must be set in water, such as uh, this set you're seeing now, uh, and not set up on dry land. And again, this is to reduce non-target catches. Once the trap's set, it should be secured with uh, trap wire or baling wire to, to either a, a tree nearby or by just uh, simply placing a, a wooden stake or beaver stick uh, into the mud and then attaching your trap wire to that. Uh, this can save your traps if you get high water and washes out or a variety of reasons. It's always good to secure your traps. These sets can be made uh, not only in and around the dam and the runs which we talked about, but uh, in the beaver lodge itself. As you can see, you walk around the lodge and the entrance will be a lot deeper than the rest of the water. You can see as you walk off down into the, the run going into the lodge set, you can feel with your feet and feel the bottom of this run, locate that entrance into the lodge. Typically, it could be three or four feet underwater uh, and set your trap all the way down on the ground. Uh, at the bottom of this run. A little more difficult than the set we saw earlier, but by using long poles, such as you see here, you can get the uh, trap secured to these long poles, and then you can slide right down the sides uh, where that trap will be placed right in the bottom of the run. To be a lot more careful in this set because you're dealing with the trap underwater and this 330 kind of bear can, can, it can be pretty painful if you get caught in it, so you want to be careful, as you see here. Run your hands down the side of the sticks to reach the jaw springs. You want to handle these traps by the springs uh, and not th by the uh, jaws itself. That's the advantage of leaving these sticks exposed. You can run your hand down those sides and, and grab up with the uh, trap directly. Another good technique is the, the snare. Uh, this is a good option if you're worried about non-targets, the, the snare, uh, as opposed to the conibear, bear, the snare being a live catch device. Uh, it's designed to capture uh, the animal alive and hold it until you get there. Uh, a little different 
technique uh, or involving some different management. You must remember to run these uh, snares every day. You need to get out first thing in the morning and run these snares because the animal will be alive in there. As, and you've got a little longer trap check regulation on the conibear. But basically it's set in the same manner such that the beaver attempts to, to move through it. Uh, as it walks through, the snare closes down on it, uh, squeezes down and holds him uh, until you can get there. A uh, no, couple other advantages to the snare, they're a lot lighter, particularly carrying uh, back in the deeper sections of the woods, uh, and they're a lot safer for the novice user. They do require a little more skill though, uh, and if you're planning on using snares, I'd recommend that you take a little time to, to get the technique down. Um, they're typically suspended by some trap wire attached to a small stake, such as you see right here held out over the run so that the beaver attempts to go right through the snare. This particular one is a, a washer lock. There's a variety of snare locks available on the market. All of them work very well for beaver in our area. But you can see here the completed set of the snare on the dam crawlover. Frank, uh, let me ask you, I was noticing you mentioned that you might need to set, release a non-target animal out of that snare. What are some techniques that you would recommend for releasing a non-target animal? Well, uh, typically uh, we're using the, uh, a choke pole, it's called, or a restraining device that's got a, a, a long pole with a cable that pulls down over it to restrain that animal. In Alabama, the uh, trap regulations require that trappers carry these. It's a, it's a device that most trappers have readily available. And you can slip it down over the animal, tighten down, and it just holds animal down, restrains him until you can get out and, and release it from the snare and then let it go. Thanks Frank. Uh, I might also add that it's not always necessary to remove the beaver from an area. Depending on what your objectives are, the water control structures may be installed that allow you to control water levels in the pond. This may have several advantages as far as wildlife management, especially for waterfowl. Now it's time to answer some of your questions on beaver damage and control measures. Maybe you've had a problem with beaver damage where you live. If so, give us a call. Our program's interactive and your questions are certainly important to us. Our toll-free number is 1-800-258-2237. That's 1-800-258-ACES. Let me ask a question. If you don't mind, maybe both of you can respond to this. I mentioned the water control structures. What are some of the situations, say a person might have a, a beaver pond where they wanted to keep the water on the area for the wildlife management uh, benefits but needed to remove the beaver so that they could uh, manage the water. What are some ways that they could be done and what are some of the benefits? Well, there's a, a variety of ways. If, if you're just trying to control some of the uh, excessive damage but keep the beaver around and, and utilize the, the benefits of that beaver complex. There's a variety of things you can do. One of the best ways is through use of water control structures. Several devices uh, that you can get plans for. Uh, the Clemson Leveler is a real popular one. There's several other designs very similar to that. And the whole idea is that uh, the dam is, uh, a small portion is removed. These devices are placed into the dam and the pipes basically extend out into the pond and allow the water to drain out at a slow rate so that the beaver don't try to plug it. And they all basically work fine uh, other than the beaver building a dam above or below it. So a lot of the, the benefits of that are dependent on the specific physical conditions of your pond. And uh, you need to look at this, but quite often it's possible to utilize these control those water levels to the point to where you can maintain all the positive benefits and reduce that damage to a minimum. One thing I might want to throw in here if I, if I can is that uh, we need to think more about the positive benefits before we jump into a strong control mechanism. Uh, right now just think of what's happening in Alabama over the past few months with all the drought we've had, especially in certain parts of the state. Beaver ponds have been one of the saviors for a lot of wildlife that may be out there. They might have made it anyway, but it certainly made it a lot easier. Some of the only water holes that was there. A lot of reptiles and amphibians depend on these and a lot of birds use them heavily and not just our, 
our wood ducks, which we know utilize them, and other waterfowl, but it, it's just a whole variety of animals that depend on this, fish and other uh, assorted aquatic uh, wildlife depend on these. So uh, certainly beavers can be a problem, water level can be a problem, but before you think about just reducing and getting rid of it all together, think about some of the advantages and see, if, and see if there's some medium or middle ground there that you might can live with rather than just getting rid of the beaver altogether. I want to remind you that you can call on our toll-free numbers. Uh, this is an excellent opportunity to call in. We've got uh, two people that are very familiar with wildlife damage problems in Alabama. Call 1-800-258-2237 or 1-800-258-ACES, and we'll be glad to field your questions. We mentioned a little earlier that at one time beaver pelts were a very valuable commodity on the fur market. What do y'all foresee as the, the future market for beaver pelts and other beaver uh, products as well? Well, I think the, the market probably we have uh, seen a, a bottom, I hope anyway, in the, in the market. I don't think that there will be a tremendous rebound, but I'm hopeful that, that we have seen the bottom. Uh, we, the, most prices uh, either stabilized or were slightly up some over the last couple of seasons. Uh, this is a world market now. It's not just the United States market. It's dependent on uh, ranch fur production in European countries, the international market. There's uh, uh, efforts to uh, close the fur trade down to, through the European community now. A lot of things happening in the world market that influence it, but I think probably we've seen the bottom and, and uh, would expect it to either stay where it is, stabilized, or slightly increase. Okay. Gary, do you? I think we agree with that. Uh, our perspective is that, that the market has changed quite considerably over the past few years. And you know, it's really a shame because this country was, a lot of this country was opened up by the, by the fur trapper, trapping beavers and following the beaver and the population of the beavers. And we've seen cycles in that, but uh, we don't see any rapid growth in the in the price of fur right now okay thanks we have a call coming in uh, from north carolina uh, go ahead please north carolina um yes we have a group that's watching the program on satellite and if we do capture beaver and it's live where where do we release the beaver are we supposed to um call the wildlife service to release it or what well that's that's one of the issues right now that makes it so difficult with uh, beaver management because uh, beaver populations have expanded to the point that uh, it's very difficult these days to get somebody to volunteer to have have beaver released on their property. Uh, of course, if you're working with a professional trapper uh, and involved in live trapping, uh, most of the time they would they would have some information on where these beaver might be released. Let me throw that out to y'all if you don't mind. You really need to contact your local game and fish agency there to be sure that the laws in your state uh, are such that you could relocate them. Every state is different and uh, that would be your first starting point with your local game and fish officials. Okay, so in other words, sometimes you have to destroy them. Well, sometimes that's necessary and sometimes that's the best thing for the overall population. It, and that may sound a little cruel, but that's sometimes the, the few have to are are not as important as the whole population. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, if you do have a call, please uh, feel free to call us one eight hundred two five eight two two three seven one eight hundred two five eight ACES. Frank, let me ask you. Uh, as far as the castor glands in the beaver, what are some of the the products that can be utilized from that? Well, the castor glands are, are a product that's traditionally been used in the perfume industry, and that, those are the large scent glands located up behind either the rear legs. Now, they're also used a lot in the uh, lure making industry for a wide variety of lures, but traditionally it's been the uh, perfume industry, the castorium in these casters actually holds scent very well and that's why it's used for, uh, in the perfume uh, marketing area. 
It's, uh, it fluctuates widely, just like the fur market, maybe a little bit more uh, so than the fur market, but it's been up uh, as high as $100 a pound, and I've seen it down as low as $10 a pound. So it, it's going to vary uh, along with the market, but from, any, from year to year, it could be a very valuable portion. Uh, we have a call coming in from Montana right now. This certainly is turning out to be a nationwide Teleconference. Go ahead, Montana. Yes, um, I have com commonly worked with beaver here, and uh, there are lots of people around that have uh, culvert problems with beaver that they uh, uh, tend to dam up uh, culverts. And wondered if there's any way that you can suggest for people to um, control the beaver that are blocking up culverts without actually taking them out or removing them. That right. there's some technique, some um, management technique that you can suggest. Okay. Uh, yes, culvert problems can certainly uh, be a major issue with beaver. The backing up of the water there can uh, do some tremendous damage. As far as uh, controlling beaver damage without removing the beaver in a culvert, Frank, uh, what would you recommend on that? Well, quite often the, uh, the leveler devices such as the Clemson leveler or other modified plans work well at a culvert situation if the physical conditions are such that the beaver cannot build a dam just above it or just below it and maintain that flooded condition over the road. But probably 50% of the cases uh, involving culverts are potential locations for these uh, leveler devices. Uh, just depending on your part of the country. I know here in the flatlands, it's not nearly as uh, effective as in some of the hillier country. Uh, Maybe may in your area that it works a lot better, but uh, we probably use them here on about 10% of the highway problems. I see. Yeah. Thank you. We have a call coming in uh, right now from Shelby County, Alabama. So go ahead, Shelby County. Jim, this is Henry Durr. How you doing? Just fine, Henry. Listen, uh, Mr. Moody mentioned earlier that uh, before draining a wet, uh, or a, I should say a beaver pond, that some wetland restrictions may apply and that the uh, landowner should contact the appropriate agency to find out if any restrictions apply. There's a lot of confusion as a county agent. I know I work with a lot of landowners, and they don't know who they're supposed to call. A lot of agencies have had control over that in the past, and the wetland regulations have changed so much in the, in, in the, recent, few, in the recent past. Which agency should a landowner start with to find out about wetland regulations? I'll agree with you. It certainly has been a good bit of confusion about the wetlands issue. Uh, Gary, would you mind uh, taking a little stab at that? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, wetland issues are one that's, that's with us now, and they're going to continue to be with us, and we're going to have to live with wetlands and, and all the implications that wetlands have. They're vitally important to us, but there is a lot of misunderstanding, and uh been some things that's gone on in the past that probably shouldn't have. Uh, we would recommend you contact the Natural Resource Conservation Service officials. That's your old SES office. They've changed the name, but it's your SES officials and get their uh, input as the definition of what it is. And we don't feel like you've got a problem with removing the dam and the water flow that was created by that dam. But, but prior to doing anything, to be on the safe side, contact your NRS, NRCS folks and uh, let them have some input into it too. That's right. Uh, the, the other part, I guess, is that you know, some beaver ponds have been around for a long, long time. And I guess they would determine, some people call them a jurisdictional wetland. Yeah, that, that's one of the reasons you need to, to contact these folks, and you don't need to uh, just rely on a, a PAT statement and let them have a look at it, and they'll give you some guidance there. And if we can be of any assistance after you've talked with them, we'll be glad to come and meet with you yeah. as well. The Natural Resource Conservation Service is supposed to make that determination. Uh, I think that would be your first place to start. Okay. That's what we need to know. Thanks, bud. Let me remind you one more time, call 1-800-258-2237 with your calls. This is, um, we're certainly getting quite a few calls coming in now. Our next call will be from Kentucky. Go ahead, Kentucky. Uh, I would like to know if a, a, a beaver could build their home in a pond. In a, in a farm pond you're talking about? Yeah. Sure, they can, and, and beavers don't always live in, in lodges like you see. And earlier in that video that you looked at, you saw a, 
uh, beaver lodge that beavers can uh, bury into the bank and have den banks. And that's one of the reasons that there can be very damaging in a farm pond because they can weaken the dam and cause the dam to wash away. So you've got to be, you really need to manage those things real quickly when you find them in a farm pond situation. Thank you. Might add that farm ponds can be one of the more difficult areas uh, to control beaver damage. Uh, understand we have a call coming in right now from Michigan. Go ahead, please, Michigan. Yes, sir. Say, very interested in your uh, thing, but what bothers me is all of these DNRs, nobody will come out and say, kill them, beaver. Everybody's so afraid to, they bat around it, and that we've got a coon problem and a beaver problem here in Michigan. And I look at it, these people don't call up and say, what am I going to do with this mouse in my cupboard? Where do I release it? They just got to realize this beaver is a 60-pound mouse. Or a coon's a 30-pound rat. And God, you've just got to get across to people and have the DNRs when somebody calls and says, what am I going to do with it? Shoot the sucker and get it over with. By God, we're paying people $30,000 a year in Michigan to trap beaver. They take them away alive drive out in the country, whack them in the head and bury them so people won't see them do it. And I think you just got to get across to people that vermin's vermin. How's that sound? Well, it sounds, sounds very direct, and of course I can certainly, sim certainly sympathize that uh, it can be a, a delicate uh, public issue. I think most state agencies, and I'll let Gary address this in just a minute, but most state agencies I uh, have to be sensitive to the concerns of everybody. Uh, I agree that lethal control certainly does seem to be a very viable alternative in many of the situations, and, it, and a lot of times it's the situation, only way to actually solve the problem. Uh, Gary, in Alabama. Well, can I say something? Sure, the, go ahead. People right now, we've got a situation going on in Bosnia. You've got more people with a beaver problem that are worried about that little beaver. I spent some time in Asia. Nobody worried about them little beavers. They got them with everything they could, but we, now we got a coon in your house, or we got beaver tipping trees over on cars, and everybody's worried about that beaver. Well, God, let them tip one of them suckers over on their Jaguar and see them what they think of that beaver. That does tend to change people's uh, opinions when something directly affects them, I think. but. Uh, we do use lethal control and we do believe in lethal control and you've already seen that earlier in this show that we've demonstrated some methods for that to be utilized and in the southeast there's no way to, there's nobody that's going to let you release beavers on their property. The, the lethal control is the only mechanism that we've got. I think, I think the main point here is that you want to utilize non-lethal controls when, when, you, when, when they're feasible. If they if they work, they're going to solve the problem, you'll want to utilize them. But if they're not, certainly you'll want to go on and consider other techniques such as your lethal control. One of the reasons that you, that you would look at non-lethal control was here in Alabama too for beaver pond management is because you want to keep the beaver there and you want to keep a certain level of water there. You don't want to remove everything. So everything is different and it depends on the landowner's objectives and what they're managing for and how they're managing is to how extensive and what type of control mechanisms you would uh, attempt to apply. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the calls that came in relative to the beaver. We're going to be taking more of your calls in just a little while on the program. We're going to take a short break right now. When we return, we're going to discuss what's a very hot topic among landowners in Alabama. That is what to do about coyotes. So stand up, take a stretch. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. If you just joined us, our program is When Good Animals Go Bad, a discussion of wildlife damage management from Auburn University. I'm Jim Armstrong, Extension Wildlife Scientist, along with Frank Boyd from USDA Animal Damage Control, and Gary Moody from the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. So far, we've discussed beaver damage and beaver control. We're going to focus our discussion now for a little while on what's a very hot topic, and that is damage from coyotes. We'll then take more of your phone calls uh, in just a little while. One of the hottest wildlife damage topics in the southeast involves the coyote. These predators are characterized by a salt and pepper gray coat color, pointy ears that stand upright, a tail that hangs down, and a white upper lip. It should be noted, however, that coat color is highly variable. Records of coyotes being killed in Alabama date as far back as the late 1920s. Whether these coyotes were native to the area or introduced is not clear. However, we do know that coyotes were introduced into Alabama in the 1930s by fox hunters. These introductions coupled with a natural eastward expansion of their range, has led to an increasing coyote population in the state. Evidence of this expansion is supported by an increase in incidental coyote kills, ranging from over 5,000 kills from 1965 to 1986 to more than 13,000 kills from 1987 to 1988. A survey of county extension agents in Alabama indicated more than 1,100 complaints about coyotes in one year. One way to determine the presence of coyotes in an area is to look for scat or droppings. Coyote scat are very similar to those left by dogs. However, the free-ranging nature and omnivorous food habits of coyotes will generally be evidenced in the scat. Depending on the time of year, coyote scats may contain rodent hair, deer hair, persimmons, and a host of other food items. In addition to wild foods, coyotes may feed on cattle, sheep, watermelons, sweet corn, and many other domestic or cultivated food items. The presence of coyotes may also be verified by locating dens. Coyotes will den up under old brush piles, trash, hollowed stumps, or any other available protective site. Presence of tracks can also verify coyotes are in the area. As a general rule, coyote tracks are longer than they are wide. The inner two toenails will turn in toward each other. It's important that we understand what's legal and what's not legal uh, with any wildlife damage problem, but especially when it comes to controlling coyotes. Here's Gary Moody as he explains the legal aspects of coyote control. All right, coyote populations are uh, very high across the state. Coyotes are found in all counties now. We do get numerous complaints from landowners on how to deal with coyotes. Uh, they may be hunted or trapped at any time during the year. There's no restrictive season and no bag limits on coyotes because they are such an efficient predator and, and they are not in any danger by their numbers. Our pressure, human pressure, is not going to do anything to diminish those numbers right now because they're a very, very adaptable animal and seem to just grow in spite of everything we try to do for them. Uh, we would encourage landowners to work with the local game and fish officials and biologists to design a program to minimize problems that they may have on their land, such as uh, illegal deposits or, or deposits of animals that they may have, disposal problems that they may have, anything that would attract the predator to their land and be as clean and efficient as they could be and then we can also provide advice on control mechanisms and we'd appreciate them contacting us and we'll help them set up a control program. The adage about an ounce of prevention being worth a pound of cure applies in almost any animal damage control situation and coyote damage is certainly no exception. This damage may be minimized through a sound preventive program recommend that you try to anticipate conditions and times when damage is likely to occur and ensure that your preventive practices are in use at those times. Frank Boyd took the opportunity to show how to trap for coyotes and discuss in detail some of the control measures 
that have proven to be effective. Uh, we're here at a sheep and goat producer's place today where they've been experiencing some coyote damage. We've been out and looked over the area and we found coyote sign traveling through these old roadways. And we're going to make our first set here. We're going to be doing a scent post set, which will be imitating the coyotes coming through, urinating the marked territory, and we'll be using a, a coyote urine. We'll put that out with the intent of the coyote coming by, smelling it, coming up, and getting in our trap. Uh, we've laid our ground cloth out first. This is to put our dirt on and kind of keep our scent away as we get started. We've selected this road here where it comes in, intersects with another road they've been traveling, and we're going to make our set right off the edge of that. First of all, we'll just scoop us out a hole about the size of our trap, putting our excess dirt on our kneeling cloth. I usually set the trap first. Then we'll just stake it. Be putting an underpan device on, keep the dirt and rocks from getting up under that pan. Then we'll bed the trap next. This is the most important part. You've got to have a good, firm, firmly bedded trap. If there's any movement at all, the coyote can feel that and will try to back out of it. Working with that free jaw up, lowering it down into the position there at the end and bedding real well around that. Next, we're going to fill in around that with some loose dirt, making sure we're not getting any pebbles or anything. And around that. We've got it bedded well. Now we do is the final. And in sandy soil like this, it doesn't take a whole lot of sifting. This is really nice soil for trapping in. All this will do is keep our pebbles out of it, keep it from fouling up the firing mechanism. Then with this loose soil, you can just take a leaf and kind of fill in that area around there to level it out. I want to leave it as natural looking as possible. And with the set post set, we're just going to utilize this old piece of log we found, and we'll apply some urine to the log to the ground right around there. Now, as the coyote travels the roadway, he'll come by, smell the scent, come in to investigate it, and hopefully get into our trap. We could have done the same thing here uh, and done a, a dirt hole set, Instead of using urine, we could have used a lure. Uh, they make commercial lures, or we could have ground our own. Uh, this is some ground cotton rat uh, with glycerin, and there's several different recipes for making your own bait. We could have dug a small hole, put some bait down in the hole, covered it up with leaves, and simulated uh, the coyote burying some food to come back for it later. All variations on this, we set the trap the same way. It's just a matter of the difference in the lure we're using. Now it's time for some more questions from you, our audience. We realize that some of you uh, have been experiencing coyote problems and it's certainly a major topic of discussion uh, among a lot of landowners. If you have a question, please call us. Our toll-free number is 
uh, it's 1-800-258-ACES. Let me ask you, Frank, uh, we mentioned on there the trapping as far as a lethal control measure and also uh, shooting as far as lethal control. What are some non-lethal techniques that would be effective for coyote control? Well, first we generally try to get work with producers with livestock damage to uh, utilize different husbandry techniques that would help with the problem. Night pinning with small flocks is an excellent technique to put the livestock up at night where most of the damage occurs. We do have situations where we even get losses during the day, however, and uh, additional techniques such as uh, herders uh, or guard animals. Our agency's been looking at guard animals over the last several years and, and finding pretty good success in small flocks with uh, guard dogs, a, a couple of different breeds. Uh, the key to that is getting a good animal, uh, utilizing them properly, learning about it beforehand. We have heard stories of individuals just picking up a dog and taking it out and not getting very good success. Uh, there's other scare devices that are available, electronic guard uh, that's uh, available through our agency, as well as a variety of other different scare devices. These. Uh, typically are limited in, in duration. They're good for two or three weeks uh, and then the animals become acclimated like most wildlife do, but uh, they can have a place within an overall strategy. Probably the best uh, non-lethal technique would be fencing, particularly electric fencing. Okay, I want to thank everybody that has called in so far and continue to encourage you to call in to 1-800-258-2237 if you have a question, uh, we'd be glad to try to help you out. I understand we have a call coming in right now from Kentucky. Go ahead, Kentucky. Uh, I'd like to know if I got a big German Shepherd, would a coyote uh, get together with it? Well, coyotes and dogs will certainly hybridize. Uh, it doesn't seem to be as major a problem in the southeast as has been in some other areas. Of course, anytime you have uh, animals out there, there is that possibility, but things that we've, we've looked at as far as skull characteristics on a lot of these coyotes that we've taken uh, don't indicate a tremendous amount of hybridization with dogs. Uh, probably a greater uh, problem would be that maybe the coyote and the dog would in some way uh, Tangle and coyotes can be pretty rough on pets from time to time. I understand we have a call coming in from Mississippi at this time. Go ahead, Mississippi. Oh, good evening. How y'all doing? Just fine. How are you? All right. Uh, I'm kind of in new coyote country over here in Mississippi. We live along the Mississippi River. And uh, I raise them old game chickens like some of us Mississippi boys do. And uh, them coyotes are really attracted uh, to stuff like poultry. But we've got a, a new thing going on around here. We've got a lot of fox hunters. And uh, I say fox hunters, they run their, their hounds in uh, sporting pens, they call them now. And it's uh, it's kind of opened up opportunities for us to trap coyotes and, uh, and not have to destroy them, but uh, offer them to the, uh, to the guys that run those expensive uh, hound dogs in them fox pens. And uh, they are very glad to have them. Most time they'll... Uh, pay you a little bit for your trouble and uh that's a real good idea and as it gets more popular uh possibly uh the trapping incentive for uh helping on the coat control uh, will take off with it that is certainly one of the the options right now especially with the uh the price of pelts and fur bearer animals uh declining uh, i'm going to let frank uh, discuss that a little bit. Frank spent several years in Mississippi working with animal damage control. Frank, you got any comments on that? Well, I, I think this is, uh, it's certainly got some potential for uh, helping out the situation. This is a relatively new thing and most states are, are working with regulations right now to come up in, with ways that they're going to regulate that within their state. It's going to vary from state to state. Uh, the main concern that's been expressed among the wildlife area right now is, is bringing in out-of-state coyotes for these pens and certainly that's something that we do not want to encourage because of uh, tr transfer of disease and a wide variety of other problems but 
I think it's probably going to be expanded some as the states come up with regulations on how they're going to manage that across. But I think they're throughout the South uh, expanding right now, or at least stable. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Gary, what Frank was saying reminded me a little bit about seems to be a lot of discussion about the impact of coyotes on wildlife populations. And from your perspective with the state agency, what's been your observation? In Alabama, our uh, experience with coyotes goes back several years. And when they first started becoming repopulated or, or plentiful in Alabama in the 70s and early 80s, we had a lot of concern about what a growing population of coyotes might do to native wildlife populations. And we've done several studies and all the studies indicate that they're not a threat uh, to the overall population. Certainly they are going to take occasional individuals and they, they are a predator and they're going to feed on, on individual animals, usually the, the weaker of the animal. But as far as damaging in, in entire populations, we don't see that as a problem. They're here. We've got to learn to live with them. There are ways to control the situation, but we're not going to eliminate them. So we, we've got to recognize that and, and go forward with what we got. Okay. Thank you, Gary. I understand we have a call coming in right now from Arizona. Go ahead, Arizona. Yes, sir. I was just wondering. I thought they uh, had outlawed uh, 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 poison bait traps for coyotes because my dog got out a couple of weeks ago and went out and ate some, apparently, and came back home and was dead in about four days. Okay. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with coyotes in Alabama, and you would want to contact your local uh, wildlife authorities uh, relative to that issue. Uh, poison baits are still used in some areas uh, in certain forms. They're not legal in Alabama due to a, a variety of uh, problems associated with the non-selectivity, also with our, our higher human density that we have in Alabama. Frank, right. what's the uh, current situation that you're aware of as far as poison baits? Uh, in terms of uh, poison drop baits, uh, the the classic thing we talk when you're talking about baits, you, you can you envision a, a piece of meat or some type of material with a toxic agent on it dropped out on the ground. There there's nothing like that currently registered. So anything used like that would 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 have to be illegal. There are some toxicants registered that are delivered through uh, in some states. They're delivered through an M44. Uh, device. It's a cyanide injector. That's a uh, very uh, strictly regulated device. And there, uh, there are a few registrations for a toxic collar where a collar is placed around the neck of a sheep or goat so that when the coyote attacks the uh, sheep, it punctures that particular uh, collar and they ingest the toxic material. But I'm not aware of any registration that would uh, be a legal use of a toxicant on a drop bait. Right. Well, that was really a heart, heartbreak for me to have my dog dig out from under the fence. You know, I might, might have eaten another animal. I don't know for sure. But uh, I was under the impression, you know, that, that that kind of poison was illegal because kids get out in the forest. You know, other 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 critters are out there. And uh, we've had coyotes around here a lot. And I've never lost any chickens or had any of my other dogs that I've had over the years put to sleep dug up by coyotes or anything else or ever heard of any other uh, contact between humans and coyotes. But... Uh, I do know that my dog ate something that was poison, and it was put out by our cattle rancher out here, I would assume, but uh, I'm not sure. Well, you know, just because it's not legal doesn't mean it's not being used. Right. And uh, that's, that's one, of the, one of the main points we want to get out today is there are problems with uh, unregistered chemicals, and that's the reason they're unregistered, because they were determined not to be as safe when used. And as long as you're using a registered product, typically those products have been uh, tested and, and looked at to where they don't feel like they're a big problem. But s well, certainly we do have problems with uh, illegal pesticides being used here in Alabama too. It's not restricted just to Arizona. Yeah, my daughter gets out of here and we walk in the forest. It always scares me that she might find something, you know, and maybe stick it in her mouth or ingest it or something because she's only two years old. But it does bother me, you know, and my dog died and that bothers me too. But I uh, thank you much for your time. Okay, thank you for your call. Let me remind you of the number to call if you have a question, 1-800-258-2237, 1-800-258-2237.
or 1-800-258-ACES. One of the misconceptions in Alabama is that coyotes are a new uh, species in the state. Actually, coyotes have been around Alabama since at least the, the early 1920s. We have photographs and records of coyotes being killed in several counties in Alabama uh, at that time, but populations really seem to explode uh, probably about the mid-70s. And I'd like to throw this question out to our two experts here as far as some reasons that coyote populations seem to expand during that time. I think it was just a combination of things. You probably had uh, more introductions going on. You had uh, increase in population in neighboring states. They were moving in from both the east and the west, and it, they're very adaptable animals. And uh, once they got here, the, our environment is very hospitable to increase in wildlife populations of that type. They're, they're an efficient predator. And there was a niche here far in the field, and they moved in and took advantage of it. Okay. I understand we have a call coming in right now from Michigan. Go ahead, Michigan. Yeah, what I wanted to ask about is uh, we had seen as many as 18, 20 coyotes in a, in a pack. And that was in April, well, it might have been February. Is that the usual number, or are they usually a lot thinner than that? Well, uh, coyotes, as far as their their group behavior tend to uh, be highly variable. We hear everything from uh, solitary animals to family units. I would think that a group of 18 would uh, certainly be a large number. Uh, seems to be fairly unusual. I'm not knowing the specifics of the situation. It'd be hard to make an exact determination, but uh, do you all have any indication of groups that large? Well, our southern coyote, uh, certainly it's not real common to have that situation. Most of our animals here are singular or in pairs, except during the uh, pupping season when they're uh, typically grouped up in a family group. But, you know, the beaver are a lot different here, too. They don't cache food. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't have to tend to living under the ice like in the northern states. So I would assume that there'll be some differences in the biology of the animal between the northern states and the deep south. Uh, we had a, an experience with a, a bow hunter attack by a couple of coyote, which seems to be very unusual. And I guess he had to ward them off with a uh, arrow, and that was just a few miles away. Typically, coyotes will not uh, become aggressive towards towards humans. Of course, there are always uh, instances, and we did have one, at least one that I know of in Alabama, of a coyote uh, attacking a hunter and his dog. Uh, let me move on. I understand we have a call coming in from Kansas. Before we take that call, let me remind you, we appreciate your calls, and if you've got your television on, which obviously you do, uh, please turn it down uh, during the time so that we won't get feedback uh, over the speakers. Go ahead, Kansas. Yeah, we got a sheep uh, dog here that looks kind of like a sheep dog and uh, a German Shepherd. He looks an awful lot like that fella in the middle. We just wonder what we should do about that. <laughs> I think, as that other guy said, shoot the sucker. <laughs> Okay, we're going to take another break now. Uh, when we come back, we'll discuss damage and control measures of one more animal that's particularly abundant in the southeast. That's the white-tailed deer. Plus, we'll have one more round of your phone calls, so please stay with us.
Welcome back. Now we're going to discuss an animal that can cause damage to plants and crops. It's also an important game animal in Alabama. Uh, we're going to discuss this because of its increasing numbers, particularly in our part of the country. Deer populations have expanded in the southeast. These high populations, coupled with their feeding habits, have resulted in an increased potential for damage to plants or crops. Deer prefer to browse on the leaves, stems, and buds of woody plants. They particularly like young, highly nutritious, fertilized ornamental plants, row crops, and seedlings. Browsing damage by deer is easy to identify by the presence of distinctive deer track and their characteristic pattern of nipping the plant. Since deer have no upper front teeth, they tear the vegetation from the plant, leaving a jagged end on the plant. Bucks may also rub trees with their antlers during the rutting season. Damage due to antler rubbing will appear as an area where bark has been scraped off of the tree trunk. As I mentioned, deer are a game animal and as such they're protected throughout the southeast. Here's Gary Moody with the Alabama Game and Fish Division to talk about the legal aspects of deer control. White-tailed deer is our most popular game animal and one of the most numerous game animals we've got in the state with populations reaching well over a million animals across the state. And although we have a heavy harvest of whitetails every year, there are some areas of the state that we still see significant crop damage on certain uh, crops. And landowners that are having these problems need to contact the local conservation officer or biologist and they will come and look at the problem with you and if it's uh, extensive damage or damage is occurring, you can get a permit to harvest animals and get a permit to harvest unantlered deer at night. We'd also encourage landowners to get onto a more aggressive hunting or harvest program. And one of the things where we have the most common problem maybe is where we have two different groups that are trying to use the same tract of land. Perhaps landowner is, is leasing the farming rights to one person and the hunting rights to someone else. And those two groups need to get together and try to help resolve the issue of the overpopulation rather than the farmer having to take things out of season and get the hunting group to take more advantage of them during the hunting season. So there are, there are management implications, management things you can do. Sometimes you can eliminate your problem by certain management strategies that you might employ on another part of the track to improve a habitat or get higher quality wildlife habitat to minimize a problem on a crop. There are a lot of things you can do that the wildlife biologist can give you advice on, the conservation officer can give you advice on, and that's the, that's the place to start with them. There are many techniques that are being used for deer control. My advice is that if you're using a legal technique and it's working, keep using it. Don't change based on my suggestion. Uh, there are various scaring devices such as noisemakers and propane cannons that may be effective for a short period of time, but deer very soon become acclimated to these. Uh, repellents tend to be most appropriate in garden situations or on ornamentals, and generally they're not feasible in a large-scale nursery or agricultural operation. Their effectiveness is highly variable. It depends on the rainfall, deer's hunger, and several other factors. There are a wide variety of commercial formulas of repellent available, uh, generally, they can be placed into two categories, your area repellents, which are applied near the plants to be protected and repel the deer by smell. The other category are the contact repellents, which are applied directly to plants to be protected, and these repel by taste. Repellents are most effective if they're applied when the trees or the shrubs are dormant. Now, I caution you to read the label carefully because many of these repellents should not be used on plant parts that are destined for human consumption. Here at Auburn, we're currently involved in testing a new repellent that shows some very promising results for use in ornamental situations, and hopefully that'll be on the market before long. Uh, the most effective long-term control measure is probably going to be exclusion of the deer from the area. We met with John Owen, who is a superintendent of the Piedmont substation of the Alabama Agricultural Experiment Station, and looked at some deer fencing to exclude deer. One of the electric fence designs that we've been working on uh, for excluding deer 
is this uh, polytape wire. I think there are several advantages to this. John, you've worked a lot with this uh, here at the Piedmont substation. Jim, I, uh, we have, of course, as you say, evaluated several designs of fences and materials. This uh, polytape wire, which is a, a plastic or nylon ribbon with stainless steel wires in it, uh, we've used it extensively, uh, and it is used a great deal by people uh, controlling animals now. Uh, one of the main reasons is it's, it's fairly cheap uh, to put up. Uh, the, the biggest reason is how easy it is to put it up. It can be put mm -hmm. up quickly and easily. Um, um, a plot like this, uh, this is about a, an acre, acre and a quarter uh, garden plot. This is a research plot for us, but many home gardens are about this size. It can be fenced uh, in a, an hour to two hours, depending on one's skill and abilities and how mm -hmm. much material they have on, on hand. Okay. Uh, for about uh, $200 worth of materials. So about 200 for an acre, an acre and a half? an acre to an acre and a half. Uh, and then an hour to two hours uh, worth of labor to uh, fence it. Well, that's, for fencing, that's pretty cheap and easy. Yes, the other too. thing is that when you get through with it, you can take it down. You can uh, roll it right back up. The electric fence companies make reels that it goes on. We've been buying uh, uh, garden hose uh, reels from from Walmart and other discount places and, and where we can roll up much more of it on a reel. And uh, you know, for just a few dollars, get a reel and roll the whole fence up. Um, yeah. But uh, it's cheap and easy. The other thing is it works. It uh, does work. It does work. These little silver uh, silver stainless steel threads are highly conductive, and uh, the animals uh, get in contact with it. It will shock them. The other thing is with the tape being as large as it is, uh, they can see it. So you uh, get some visual some repellency visual as well. Repellency. And uh, we seem to think that uh, many people tell us that as they see it fluttering, in the wind, that that adds to its visual repellence. So, yeah, I mean, we've certainly not been able to to uh, uh, substantiate that claim with research, but many people seem to think that that adds to the uh, visual repellency. Uh, much more visible than the uh, smaller uh, single-strand electric wire that uh, so many of us were used to. It's yeah. tough. Um, so it does hold up. You had any trouble with it, with deer running through it or anything? Well, no. Uh, you know, it, the nice thing about it is, you know, it, you can bend it, stretch it down, you know, and then it comes back. Uh, if something gets in it, uh, they generally can get out of it. Right. Uh, and it doesn't leave you a mess. It's not like a wire that they get hung in, and if they break it, they string it halfway right. across the field or, or something like that. This is a, a portable charger that I will power this polytape and max flex fence, and one of the advantages of these is that it doesn't have to be used in an area where you've got a source of electricity. Um, on this one here, we have it hooked up to a, a battery. John, about how long will it run on a battery like that? It depends on how much load you've got on the fence, uh, how much of it is, uh, how often and frequently it's being discharged, how many weeds are up on the fence, that type of thing, Jim. But, uh, Normally on a, a regular 12 volt uh, deep cycle marine battery and one of these small chargers on a, a um, plot this size, a garden size plot, we're getting six to eight weeks per charge on it. These are the New Zealand type, the high voltage, high amperage type chargers. Right. Uh, these running uh, from four to five to seven thousand volts uh, on the line. Um, the uh, uh, chargers uh, additionally come as uh, alternating current chargers and not battery powered and where you're close to a source of electricity if you're close to your house close to a barn or shop with electricity uh, that's a far more dependable source uh, easier cheaper source of power than the uh, battery powered charger uh, it doesn't take near as much maintenance to keep the weeds off the line and uh, you don't have to keep checking to see if your battery is is you know, it's still hot enough to power right. the charger, and uh, uh, works real well. We commonly would bury uh, you know, up to three or four hundred feet of uh, underground cable, or run a along a fence, run a, a, an electric wire from a charger. Put the charger say in in a garage or in a shop, uh, and then run a wire out 
you know, three to four hundred feet. Uh, here we've run them a half a mile, three quarters of a mile to an area that we're we're fencing. Uh, the uh, uh, alternating electricity, the AC electric charged uh, uh, fence charger is a um, much more efficient, easier to use right. source. More dependable. The battery powered ones, uh, you know, can go places where you don't have electricity. And you right. can also include um, uh, solar panels with these battery powered ones that you have out in remote areas that'll help keep your battery charged and, and uh, uh, help keep it, you know, charged up for a longer period of time. This is a uh, typical installation for a battery powered charger with battery uh, connected to the fence charger, and here this fence charger is just hanging on the uh, electric fence. Um, it's connected by a wire then to the fence, uh, and then all the wires on the fence are tied together. Um, the charger is also hooked here to the uh, uh, ground rod. Um, and the reason that the ground is so important uh, is that uh, with an electric fence, what we're trying to do is make a complete circuit from the charger, through the fence, through the animal, in this case a deer, to the ground, and then back through the ground, to the uh, ground rod, and back to the charger to make a complete circuit so then that that um, shock, that impulse, electric impulse, will go through the animal that's trying to go through the fence. So the better the ground, the better uh, a shock that we're going to have. Um, just a, an 18 inch, two foot piece of rod stuck in the ground um, is, um, is often inadequate. Uh, if you don't want to buy a code uh, uh, rod, uh, these are eight to ten dollars at, at most supply stores, uh, a steel T post will work, uh, will work well. If you use an adequate ground clamp, they're painted and that's where you need a good ground clamp. Mm -hmm. But um, a good ground is essential. This is a more permanent electric deer fence design. It's one I know that y'all have been working on out here to try to perfect since you have quite a bit of uh, deer damage on the, on the substation. Tell us a little bit about this one, if you don't mind, John. Jim, this is the design that, uh, through our evolution and designs that we've settled on to, uh, that gives us our, uh, what we feel is our optimum uh, control of deer, uh, to keep deer out, exclude deer from our research plots and research areas. And this is a, a eight wire fence. The top wire is at 73 inches. Uh, the wires are spaced uh, starting from the top about 15 inches apart, go to about an eight inch spacing in the middle, and then as we go down to the ground, they're about six inches apart. The bottom wire, we try to keep from four to six inches off the ground. If it's more than that, the deer will find a low place and will go underneath the fence. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, the, this design of fence works well, uh, and it's fairly economical. Uh, it can be put up for from 75 cents to a dollar per foot for, uh, for materials. We're talking about wire and post and hardware. Uh, the fence, uh, of course, is electric, so we have insulators here to insulate, uh, keep the charge from bleeding off at the fence. Our line posts then are fiberglass stays and with occasionally with a um, wood post for a line post. That post also has insulators on it. This post here is a 6 by 6 pressure treated pine. Um, it's uh, 12 feet long. There's uh, 6 feet of the post in the ground six feet above ground uh, and uh, we have concrete also around the post and uh, the post is, is braced with what we call a floating brace over here this brace is attached to the post goes down to the ground it's just sitting on top of the uh, ground on a board and then uh, there is a wire and uh, with ratchet that that holds it tight and pulls it back uh, uh, to do this properly, we have since learned that this brace for maximum strength should be about half of the height of the post. Uh, not to the top, but to right about half of the, of the height of the, the force is being applied by the fence. And that gives you a much longer brace out that way. And then you can pull back and, and get it tighter and stronger. Now, how far apart do you have your spacer wires? On this fence for... Uh, 
for the appearance, for the aesthetics. Uh, we have um, um, our stays about a hundred feet apart uh, with um, our line post, our wood post about 200 feet apart. To, to do this practically um, uh, around a field or farm, uh, the line posts only need to be either at low places or high places on hills where you have a change in the direction of the wire. And um, I have used um, uh, the stays, these fiberglass stays, as far as 300 feet apart. So that in a, in a farm situation, uh, uh, you, you, know, you would not need them as close as we have them here. Right. They could be much further apart. Jim, one of the uh, essential components of um, the electric fence that we found on these, particularly these large installations, are these fairly simple, inexpensive knife switches that we use to cut a section of fence or a fence off and on. Uh, we open it like this, the fence is off, we close it back, it's on. Uh, depending upon the source, this switch costs six, seven, or eight dollars. But in this case where we've got several miles of fences leading up to this fence, and then we want to work on this fence, do maintenance on it, working around the fence, we can simply come up, cut the, this fence off without having to cut our entire uh, fin, you know, So it cuts off just this section. So we're just cutting off this section of fence with this switch here. So. Yeah, I hope that uh, video gave you some information to use when you go to put up an electric fence for controlling deer, not only in constructing the fence, but also in how to manage and maintain the fence as well. It should be noted that sport hunting in the area may also help in controlling population expansion. This is your final opportunity to call us if you have a question or a comment about anything we've discussed today. We'd like to hear from you. Our toll-free number is 1-800-258-2237. That's 1-800-258-ACES. Uh, Gary, I know one thing that the, the Game and Fish Division has been involved in, excellent program that has uh, gone a long way in helping landowners reduce deer damage has been the Deer Management Assistance Program. Tell us a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Yeah, that program really has been extremely popular in Alabama. You know, our population has grown from somewhere in the middle 60s from about 40,000 to well over a million animals now. And through the 70s and, and into the early 80s, our population was ever increasing. Our seasons and bag limits got more liberal. And for people in other parts of the country, they may not even appreciate what we have as far as bag limits, but we generally begin our, our gun deer season right before Thanksgiving, hunt all the way through January without a break with an antler deer per day bag limit and in some during either sex days an antler deer and an unantler deer per day bag limit and we still were not able to control the population so we had to come up with some more effective mechanism to uh, control our population and I think if we have time we need to talk a little bit more about okay. that program. We may come back to that. Uh, I understand we have a call coming in at this time from Delaware. Go ahead Delaware. Hi, we just up an electric fence how do you test it to see if it's working? Because I don't think it is. It's making a clicking sound on a box that we have, um, and we don't have a tester. Is there any other way to test it? Well, the most reliable way to test it is going to be with a voltmeter. Uh, and you should be able to test that every, every morning, uh, which is what I would recommend to make sure that it is staying hot. Okay. Uh, a critical thing with electric fence is that you do keep it keep it hot because if that fence goes down and it's not hot, the deer will learn that they can get through it. I would recommend uh, that you do get a voltmeter uh, to test it. That's that's the most reliable way. I understand that we have another call coming in at this time uh, from Maine. Go ahead, Maine. Hi, I'm calling from Maine. I was wondering. How are we going to control coyotes in the future when they have no predator? We have very few trappers because there's no um, value for the hide, and it's just, they're getting to be quite a problem up here. Yeah, they they can be a, a major major problem just about anywhere anymore. Uh, of course, coyotes have always occupied the position 
once they get grown pretty close to the top of the food chain, haven't been a lot of major predators on uh, grown coyotes. I don't necessarily think that they will they'll continue to be a, a growing problem. I think eventually it will reach some level of stabilization. Of course, there are uh, state and federal programs that will continue to be involved in wildlife damage uh, control, uh, such as USDA Animal Damage Control and state wildlife agencies. I asked Frank, if you don't mind, since you are involved in one of those agencies, your comments on that. Well, you know, I think definitely the lack of trapping is, is probably playing a, a bigger role than anything in, in this mid-level predator range. I think you're seeing a lot, a lot of increasing problems with coyotes, raccoons, uh, fox, bobcat, all the, those mid-level predators that uh, have traditionally been under trapping pressure, the uh, surplus individuals have been removed through the sport trapping season. With the decline in this trapping, these populations are uh, enjoying quite, quite a good success right now, and uh, the problems are up. I think that's going to uh, stay the road as well. As long as trapping pressure's down, the populations will be up, and the, the uh, corresponding problems will be up. But I think you're right, too, in that it's probably going to level out. It won't continue to increase forever. They'll reach a saturation level sometime, but definitely we're seeing the increase now, particularly in our part of the country. I believe this is having a good bit to do with the increase in rabies as it moves up through our state. Good. Let me remind you of the phone number uh, one more time. That's 1-800-258-2237, 1-800-258-2237. I'd encourage you to call in about deer damage, uh, beaver damage, or uh, coyote damage that you may be experiencing, or if you have questions about those species in general. Let me ask one more question of our uh, group here. We're getting more and more complaints about deer damage to gardens, to ornamental situations, and what do you think is causing that in these residential, more urban areas? You know, I think a lot of the things that, that's really causing that is not so much an increase in the deer herd because the deer herd has been uh, high now for several years, but it's probably a fact that we're getting a, a re-ruralization, if there is such a word, is that a lot of the people that are moving from the, the heavy, dense urban areas to the suburbs, the, the far out suburbs, maybe where they got a little larger estates and uh, maybe small tracts of land where they've got a lot of gardens that are close together, but they're moving into deer country and deer habitat and the deer are still there. So uh, they just uh, automatically assume that population of deer and they take on the problems associated with it. And I, I think that's probably what we're seeing more than, than perhaps uh, a sudden increase in the number of, of deer in an area. Okay. Thank you. As we close out, I'd like to ask each of you, I'll start with Frank, if you had any uh, final words of advice on wildlife damage management in general uh, for, our, for our callers, what would you recommend is the one thing? Frank, if you go first. Well, I don't know about the one thing, but I think probably the, the key to a successful control program would be to evaluate the problem sufficiently to begin with. Too often, uh, landowners just jump into some type of control without fully evaluating exactly what the problem is, making sure you've got a good identification as to what species is causing that problem. Uh, this is critical. If, you, you know, if you've got uh, damage to the side of your house and, and you're trapping squirrels and it turns out to have been a raccoon that chewed in there, you're not going to do very good about controlling your damage. So a, a good evaluation is critical. Uh, look at all your options. An integrated control strategy is always much more successful than just one single technique. So I guess I would say focus on evaluating it properly and utilizing an integrated program with a variety of techniques and you'll have a much more success. Gary, any closing comments? I think Frank's right on target. If you don't know what your problem is, it's real hard to find a solution to it and I would also just throw in there to remind everybody to contact the state and appropriate state and federal agencies to be sure that whatever you're doing is within the laws of that jurisdiction and uh, you've got whatever permits you need and then you can get started on a proper control program. 
Thanks. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this program related to beaver, coyotes, and deer, and specifically their uh, damage problems. I want to remind you that when they're not in conflict with human activities, all three of these species are very valuable parts of our environment. Hopefully some of the information you've gathered tonight can help ensure that your encounters of these species stay positive ones. Thanks to Frank Boyd and Gary Moody for all your help. Thanks also to John Owen of the Piedmont Substation. And thanks to each of you for joining us. I'm Jim Armstrong. So long. The preceding program was produced by the Alabama Cooperative Extension Service.